of. There's no freedom without responsibility. Exactly. There, there's an equal and enduring responsibility that comes with freedom. And this is such a permissive time. And responsibility is such a terrible word. Nobody wants to take up responsibility. Yeah. And you really can't enjoy freedom without responsibility. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome once again to What We Didn't Say on Sunday. I'm David Chauncey, the lead pastor here at Westside Baptist Church in Gainesville, Florida. And I am privileged to be here, not with Richie Baldwin. Richie is again. He's out. He's coming back from the mission field. But I'm here with Asa Walker. Asa is one of our pastors on staff. Uh, he's been here how long? 14 years? Longer than that. Uh, huh? I've been on staff. It'll be 15 in August, and I've been in, in total 17 years. Yes. Interned a little bit before I became on staff. Yeah, and just just the list of things he's done at Westside is fairly impressive. From uh, I think you helped the last pastor edit one of his books or put it you know when i was his intern that was my yeah, you yeah, helped work on one of his jobs. books you you've helped you were a music intern you worked with our student ministry then you were a long time our student pastor yep. and uh then you shifted out of that you did some uh work with our communications and all sorts of things it must mean you have uh you're a man of many talents well, uh, I've certainly picked up a lot of little responsibilities <laughs> through the years. One time I asked a custodian here what he was using to clean the floor because it smelled nice. Yeah. And he said, I'm not going to tell you. You'll have my job next. There you go. And I'm kind of glad he didn't. Yes. Uh, but right now you're our community pastor. And really that is uh, um, uh, Asa works as kind of the front face to a lot of our community ministries, to our schools. And building bridges is what I love to think that you're doing. Yes. Building bridges to our community across which our folks can venture forth as gospel ambassadors. That's right. And it's really, it's taken me in front of a lot of people in a lot of different places. I've ended up on high school football fields and band rooms. I've ended up at uh, Rayford Prison, uh, not incarcerated, <laughs> thankfully. Yet. Uh, the sheriff's <laughs> office, halls of government, uh, working with nonprofits, and of course, our wonderful ministry partners across our community, mm -hmm. uh, and we have so many of them. So it uh, it's never a boring day. Yeah. I just have to wake up and say, okay, it's Tuesday. What yeah. am I doing today? Who am yeah. I today? Well, we're we're always uh, you're always a blessing, and always um, uh, when you do preach. And you preached it normally at Newberry for me a good bit, but right. now you were over at our. Was that your first time preaching in our Southwest campus? I think it's my third. Third time. Yeah, it's not very frequent, but okay. uh, when when Richie is in Romania, he needs somebody to fill in. Thankfully, he thought of me. Right. So it was great to be over there with that crowd. Now, since Jordan was here, our last campus, Southwest campus pastor, we started doing these series, and we'd plan them way in ahead. But I know you love you. You kind of like having the ability to just do what's on your heart. But I just have appreciated you've fallen in line with our um, schedule, right? Of texts, right? So <laughs> you ended up this past Sunday with yeah. not an easy. I it was basically four or five chapters of right. the Ten Commandments, and then these all the, these examples of applying those command, commandments, not in our culture, right? But the people that had oxes yeah, and donkeys and... I've noticed uh, you and Richie both, uh, you'll ask me to preach and then tell me what the text is. Yeah. And so I think the last time I preached for you, I was handed something in the Revelation. Yeah. And yeah. then Richie asked me to preach and it's uh, don't you know boil a baby goat and it's mother's milk. And yeah. so you know, easy text to apply. Right, right. Well, we appreciate you stepping in and doing that. And so I'm anxious to hear... You know, with that one opportunity to, to venture into Exodus, uh, you've been following along, I guess, listening to me walk through Exodus, so you were familiar with the context, but right. um, I'm going to give you three minutes like we normally have. We'll both have three minutes to kind of give a recap, and then we'll talk about what, what you studied and probably would have loved to talk about but didn't have time to. Uh, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. All right. I here mean, you go. as the humble guest. Yes. Um so we've, I think, now come to the end of this Wilderness U series. Yes, and we're moving on towards the tabernacle. Right. Yeah. So with the final installment, 
uh, you have this huge text of all of these ordinances and these applications of the Ten Commandments. And as I read through it, the thing that was most arresting to me actually does not come until Exodus 23, beginning in verse 20. And after all of these applications of the law, suddenly there's this interlude, and it's this most unusual interlude because it's a promise of presence. It's a provision of God's presence in the midst of all of these laws and ordinances that we're to follow. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you this angel, and you need to listen. Don't rebel against him. And what's striking about it is just about the time you think that these people would really find a map useful, just about the time you would think what they desire from God is a compass or someone to lead them in the wilderness, or some type of signpost on the road to help them know the way out, God gives them a way to live. It's not direction for the choices to make necessarily on the the wilderness journey to get to the promised land, but rather it's instruction for daily living. And that daily obedience is what brings those people home. But it's only after God intervenes. His hand through that angel comes down and guides them the rest of the way. And that same provision of presence is what you and I need. It's the only thing that redeems us from our sin and brings us through our wilderness because the reality is, I can't do this. We can't take all of those laws and apply them perfectly. And when we fail, we've got to have a hand that reaches out and guides us the rest of the way home. So that's where we really uh, found our are mooring in that text yesterday. And my encouragement ultimately was in every moment, whether you know what God's doing or not, whether you know why he's doing it or particularly why now, you simply trust the hand that guides you knowing that he'll take you safely home. Hmm. All right. You did uh, well. You've got a few more minutes. Anything else you, you preached? <laughs> I've got you, a few more you minutes. Got 40 seconds. 40 seconds. Uh, there were some great illustrations in there. Name one. Um, so I, I got to hear uh, this Holocaust survivor uh, who he was in a ghetto, and all of a sudden, one late afternoon, he's a little boy at this time, he feels this hand just reach down and grab his, and he looks up, and he can hear by the accent that it's a German man, and the man says, don't say anything, pull your hat down over your head, and look down at the ground. Don't look up, don't look at anybody, and don't say a word. And they start to leave the ghetto, and they get to the gate, and the guard suddenly reacts and says, what are you doing? Why are you here? And, and this man says, this man says, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry, I just brought my boy here to show him what we're doing and to explain to him why we're having to do it. And the guard says, well, you know, if this gate would have closed, You'd have been locked in here all night. Get out of here. Don't ever come back. And he said, I promise it won't happen again. And this man took him a few paces down the road, and he said, keep running down this road. In a few miles, there's a town. If you start running now, you'll get there before dark. And don't turn back. Don't stop. Just run until you get to that town. And the very next day, the train came and evacuated that ghetto and took everybody there to an extermination camp. Wow. And so this this who was a boy at the time has no idea who this German man was, uh, no idea why he exactly right. The, the provision of presence and, and literally sometimes God's hand just reaches out and grabs ours. And we don't understand everything he's doing, but he leads us in the way we need to go. Mm, That's great. That's great. Uh, Bo, you think you can leave all of that in there because I gave him an extra he's a guest he got a guest pass I even stopped yeah when the bell rang I gave him a guest executive decision guest pass to finish what was a gripping illustration that's a good one if we were to stop it it would have been quite the cliffhanger yeah we would have had phone calls I'd have been okay with it yeah Um, well it's interesting because you bring up what we're gonna see moving forward with the tabernacle is God when they leave the mount yeah you know, he puts his presence in a skin tent That's and right. moves around with the camp. And uh, all of this kind of taking a step-by-step step towards God in the tent of a human body, right. which is Christ, and then God in a corporate body, the temple of right. that 
that is you and I as the church. That's right. And so it's this beautiful progression of God's presence from the angelic, his presence through uh, the prophets and mediators to his presence in his son and now his presence in his in the spirit. I think Asa, to me, you know, if if people will hang on through this Exodus series and think about it that way, why I feel like it's such an integral part is it helps them understand the whole Bible is how For it all sure. ties together in this picture of how God's getting us back into the Garden of Eden, right? Where we were in imperfect presence with Him. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that, I'm sure folks got a lot out of that. Uh, let me kind of share a little bit about um, my three minute recap. Of, you you preached the other part of that text. Yes, I did. Yeah, um, I didn't get to the angelic part there. With um, I I wanted to kind of address humanity and what the law does for us. What's the role of the law in the life of the church in as new covenant believers, and, and what did God really mean for it, it to do? And uh, I started with an illustration about roommates, because it's Wilderness University. Yeah. You think you're free from your home and your parents and all the rules, and, and you think, I'm not going to have to make my bed. I'm not going to clean my room. You just think you're free like you've left Egypt. But then you move in with roommates, and then all of a sudden you want law back. All of a sudden you want them to keep their side of the room clean, and you realize you're not free. You're now enslaved to the uh, degree of cleanliness mm. or uh, of your roommate. Mm. You're now – the taskmaster also is – the the syllabus and the professor and That's so right. we're never truly free because we exist under an authority god and we exist among others people and because of their presence there need to be guidelines and regulations and so god basically says all right i want to be your roommate i want we're going to have that presence mm-hmm. we're going to move together mm-hmm. i'm going to be your god here's the rules of vertical relationship with me, this is this is how we're gonna we're gonna um, get along, and then here's how: if you're gonna live together as a community, that's a treasure possession, a holy nation, and a priest, and you're like a priest to the world. That people are gonna look at you and think this is how we're supposed to live. Here's here's the regulations. Here's the way to do it. So they're characteristics, right. not just rules. That's right. They're a demonstration of this is what godly people. Holy people living in right relationship vertically with God and right relationship uh, horizontally with each other. This is what it's supposed to look like. And so, I, 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 my my outline basically was that one nation under God looks like this. Mm. Uh, it's a joyful community because what joy there is when people are living justly with one another. Right. And then it will be a just community where we internalize this law, the Ten Commandments, to where if we if we run over our neighbor's ox or accidentally kill them, we replace the ox or we give them a, 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 the financial equivalent. Right. It's how do we apply loving our neighbor to everyday things? And so God didn't mean... I I imagine that with these court cases, these these this case law that God actually wrote out for them was meant to be internalized so they didn't have to go to court. Right. We you wouldn't know, need them. We wouldn't need yeah. them. And I said, if we could live this way, imagine what a joyful community and a just community would be. And then, oh, I go get. I got to give my third point. Come on, Bo. And obviously, they didn't do a very good job live, being a joyful, just community, and yeah. neither have we. No. So God's final solution is mm. not the law. Oh, it's Jesus. So it, it, uh, the ultimate community is a Jesus community, and um, that's kind of how I ended. And we went into the Lord's Supper. Did you do the Lord's Supper there? We did. Yeah, awesome. we had the Lord's Supper. Okay. You know, your summary reminds me of uh, the, a question I was asked a lot as youth pastor about the law is, you know, why does God give it in the first place? And my favorite analogy to use is it, my car has an owner's manual. I didn't write it, and I can't interpret it just however I want 
the engineers who designed and built the car wrote the owner's manual, and that's exactly who needs to write the owner's manual. And so often these laws are our owner's manual. The designer and creator of life has given us the instructions on how to live successfully and how to live peacefully with one another. And if we just follow it, we could maintain this life in a lot better yeah. shape than we often do. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, I think that a, a joyful, just society, a kingdom, a, a, a people, yeah. is what everybody wants in this world. I mean, no doubt. There, you know, without, I mean, certainly psychopaths and others, but right. even most of the bad people think, oh, communism is going to produce this. It's joy <laughs> and joyful justice. Good and luck. so they go through that, and then it doesn't work because it's full of human beings. Right. But everybody wants a fair society where no one takes their stuff. Um, they just don't know how to get to it, and they don't realize that it's impossible apart from a new heart. Mm -hmm. And so the end of my message we got to, our, to the old covenant requires the new covenant, and the new covenant comes with blood that – is sufficient, one sacrifice right. that's sufficient, and it comes with a new heart. And that's what makes it possible. And so the one nation under God that America wants to be, mm -hmm. uh, well, they don't, they don't, we don't take seriously, most of Americans don't take under God seriously, uh, because that would mean trying to live out these regulations, not because the court and the police tell you to do it, right? but because this is what treating your neighbor with love looks like the joyful position of our heart to go and do it yeah it, it, which is a disposition toward others and toward god rather yeah. than toward ourselves yeah yeah and um but that that little play on words i sometimes i i don't know that i had a major blooper this sunday but i want to hear if you had any but Sometimes I, I try to avoid having a political statement that gets people thinking down the wrong road. Yeah. But in this case, I used intentionally, I went one nation under God to get people to think this thought, is that what would one nation under God really look like? And we tend to think it's, it's going to look like the United States of America. Well, um, this is a different type of thing, and, and we'd love for the United States of America to be more committed to Christ. and But that's individuals that can do that, commitment to Christ. But the nation that is truly under God is what he's describing here in these laws. Mm. It's uh, one God, no graven images, never taking his name in vain, giving a Sabbath day, uh, honoring their father and mother, and then loving their neighbors in a non-covetous way, not taking their wives or their possessions and all and he describes what that really looks like. And, and I think part of what our nation, our founding fathers tried to do was integrate those, that Judeo-Christian law right. into, into law. Right. But what the laws of our land cannot do is force someone to have that new heart right. and disposition to actually obey it. And then it, it, so we're always going to have that struggle of wanting it so badly, but we know that it can't fully be realized apart from a radical transformation of Christ. Yeah, yeah. And the tension is, and we know that that is absolutely the case. There cannot be a change of heart without Christ, and there's not going to be a change of the desire without that new heart. Uh, but I think we're starting to see that there is at least some role that law plays yeah. in defining what's normal behavior, defining what's acceptable, those agreed upon community values that we're going to share in our interna interactions with one another. And so there's there's been a little bit uh, of a push toward antinomianism, so to, so to speak, uh, but now I think that pendulum's starting to swing and we're beginning to see Maybe it's not just a free for all. Yeah. Maybe there really is some value in defining how we want to get along with each other, even if we have people that don't always do that. Yeah. So it's it's again that brilliant tension that we see in all of Scripture. It it really is. Yeah. And without 
without internal regulation, we've got to have external laws. Right. They're absolutely nece- necessary. And if people aren't going to, um, aren't going to do what's right uh, because of their internal um, response vertically, because they're responding to the authority of God, therefore right. they do what's right horizontally. When, yes, when, right. To their neighbors. Right. They're not going to do that. Then you have to put some sort of substitute vertical authority over them. Yes. If they refuse God. Right. Then it's going to have to be government. That's right. And even God says, I work through government to do that. That's why he establishes governments. Yep. And like Romans, what is it, 15 or Romans 13 talks about this. God had to establish government with the power of the sword to actually enforce laws that are built on these these Ten Commandment principles. Mm -hmm. Um, But right now, it's just people want to be free, but they don't realize there's really no true freedom apart from the boundaries and the guidelines of God's justice and love. There's no freedom without responsibility. Exactly. There, there's an equal and enduring responsibility that comes with freedom. And this is such a permissive time. And responsibility is such a terrible word. Nobody wants to take up responsibility. Yeah. And you really can't enjoy freedom without responsibility. No. Well, what did you, uh, <clears throat> did you, did you have any kind of things you wish you hadn't said? The, the only moment was I kind of got off notes and, describing in another illustration uh, something you know completely unrelated and then I just started to think out loud about a, a Baptist pastor walking into a bar and <laughs> the jokes that come from that and I had to stop myself and say let me get back to my notes <laughs> and it, I mean it wasn't too bad I've certainly had worse bloopers and sermons yeah certainly I mean it was it was very tame but that's what happens when you start to to process out yeah. loud yeah yeah you you got to catch yourself, pull yourself back before you oh, really do, do all get off into the weeds. I do it all the time. Yeah. I, I have ADD moments. I don't think I'm classically ADHD or whatever it is, but I will I will chase a squirrel mentally, and I just have to remember. I don't have to tell people I've just chased that squirrel. No, everybody sees it. Sometimes yeah. I, I actually say, I can't believe, you know, I actually speak to it. People find that somewhat humorous, but then I have to work to get them back in the Right. flow of the message yeah you got to carve that path back yeah yeah um i'm i wanted to ask you because the week before maybe it was two weeks ago i can't remember if i had a blooper because you would know i i took a stone tablet in, up into the pulpit yeah that someone made for you that's right and it had uh one of your two commandments as student pastor a camp camp rules right I thought it was a great illustration of why we uh, we set a standard at the very beginning of camp. Right. This is how we're going to get along. And your first two laws involved bodily cleanliness. Yeah. And uh, you shall not – no, everyone will take a we'll shower, shower every, every day. day. Yep. And everyone will use – Deodorant. Deodorant. And not – but then I – continued to read what was written on there and um the the 930 group kind of laughed yeah more so than the 11 and the 11 didn't laugh as much about where you you proceeded and it was written there so yeah. i just read it if you and not any of this natural stuff or if you don't mm-hmm. do it at home uh we're gonna use chemicals yeah uh, so i wondered did you get any pushback people kind of saying you know I didn't hear anything, did you? No. No, I didn't. The, I just want to make now, sure. Those, so those laws are like 10 years old at this point. And at the time they were created, there was, for whatever reason, a push toward natural solutions for underarm deodorant yeah. and something about <laughs> aluminum in, in deodorant causing cancer and all of this. Uh-huh. And so we we had to specify that at least for this, you know, four days, right? Four days exposure across four days. Hopefully, will not you. cause no. lasting no. harm. So, for four <laughs> days, Old Spice. When you get back, you can use we your want full aluminum. Th- 
whatever it yeah, takes. We want full yep. antiperspirant, full deodorant. We don't want just the deodorant. We need the antiperspirant right. and the deodorant. Yeah, that's right, um, because the Himalayan rock salt's not going to, you know, <laughs> that that isn't stopping teenage uh no yeah yeah so yeah and and those two laws were in place because we realized very quickly that uh number one we had kids that at that time they thought spraying down acts all over themselves was would mask it exactly yes, yeah and it doesn't no. it just it adds another it, it layer amplifies of amplifies it somehow yes so you can't get rid of that unique bo that only a lack of effective deodorant can produce. That's right. And so that's where the shower thing came mm. from was, you know, actually be clean. And then we would have uh, kids that being away from home for the first time, some yeah. of them, yeah. they just had to be reminded yeah. wearing deodorant is something new for them. And uh, they had to be reminded to put that on because otherwise we're going to get into a Thursday night camp service. And those who have been to camp, they know <laughs> this is when the Holy Spirit moves, this is God breaks out, decisions are made, and the devil will use stench. Yeah. And someone won't be able to pay attention. There will be a, a wonderful gospel message yeah. coming from the platform, and they're there gagging, trying to hold it together. Uh, so we just we just had to get some rules in place. And I'll tell you what. Every time we went to a camp where there were multiple youth ministries on the location, yeah. we had the best yeah. smelling oh, group. Man. The best, I mean, hands down, everywhere we went. Yeah. It wasn't even a race. You left a fragrant, a pleasant, pleasing aroma, aroma before the Lord. That's right. Before yeah. the Lord. I do think there's something holier, holy about that. I mean, why would, the, I mean, God had incense burnt in the tents and different things That's like true. that. I mean, that's but true. I forget how I used it, but anyway, I wanted to personally thank you for such a good sermon illustration. Yeah, uh, and letting me sh use your actual Ten Commandment stone. It, my interns got that for me, and mm -hmm. uh, it was a very appropriate gift. And it has been used at camp ever since. It's been held up before the the gathered crowd as a reminder. Oh, well, you preach kind of a focused one focused passage. Anything you wish you had been able to talk about or that maybe is a favorite topic among those chapters? Well, there was a great illustration that mm -hmm. it was one of those things, and I know you run into this all the time, you find the illustration, it's it's incredible, but it just doesn't have that direct fit that it needs to. Mm -hmm. And everything inside of you wants to make it fit, but I've always found when I'm forcing an illustration, it just it's better to leave it out no matter how good it is. Mm -hmm. And I get to teach in a lot of places on leadership, and so I'm constantly putting together these illustrations of leadership, and I came across this great one around 9-11, and it's from uh, Ladder 10, which is, if you go to Ground Zero, it's it, like almost directly across from Ground Zero is this little fire station, and today it's very easy to spot because it's it's all decorated heroically for uh, what that that group of firefighters did on 9/11. But there were six. I, I I think I've got this right that there were six firefighters at ladder 11 or ladder 10 uh, when the trade tower was hit. They were first due, being literally a block away, and I believe. It's out of six, five of them lost their lives that day. Hmm. And the one who survived was actually in the lobby of the South Tower when the building collapsed. And as I think this is also right, the only known survivor from that lobby, I, that, that might be wrong. Wow. But he miraculously survives. And once he's out of the, the rubble, he realizes that his brother, who's also a firefighter, but from a different firehouse, was on the scene, and he's looking frantically for his brother, and he eventually is just in despair. He's trying to call him on the radio. He's trying to call his, um, the, you know, the unit that he's part of, and he can't get anybody. And so at this moment of just desperation, he sits down, and with all this dust, his mouth is just caked, and he looks over, and he sees this fire hydrant that's just dripping water. Hmm. And it's 
you know, all the water mains were cut. So it's just what little bit is, is dripping out of this. And he walks over to it just to splash some water in his face and drink a little bit. And as he's getting close to it, he looks up and realizes there's another firefighter who's coming to that same hydrant and it's his brother. Wow. And so they have this miraculous reunion, but then here's the best part. This is the most astonishing thing. So that's lower Manhattan. When the towers fell, all of Manhattan basically gets locked down and particularly ground zero, like you couldn't come in or out. You couldn't, you couldn't get across it. So instead of going to his home in Manhattan that night, he decided when he left the firehouse, he was going to walk over the Brooklyn Bridge and go into Brooklyn where his family, uh, a lot of, he grew up there and a lot of his family lives. So he's going over the bridge, he's walking across and midway he meets this construction worker who's just leaning on the railing and the guy starts talking to him and he tells the story of where he was that day and that he had just found his brother but then he came back to the firehouse to realize that they had lost almost all of the 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 guys that were stationed there Uh, so many of them came rushing in and went into the towers even the ones that were off and this construction worker said well listen god has a plan and a purpose bigger than what you can understand and you survived for a reason so you've got to tell your story. You've got to tell people about the, the heroism you saw. You've got to tell people about what God did that day. You've got to tell people about how you found your brother and encourage people with these stories of the miracles you witnessed. And so he's you know just talking with this guy and getting encouraged and, and kind of getting this perspective. And as he comes over the bridge, there's a group of guys that are waiting there because Everything going into Manhattan is closed. And they see that he's a fireman. They hand him a bottle of water. And the guy says, well, would you give this this other guy that's with me, would you give him some water too? And they said, what other guy with you? And he turns around. He says, well, there's this construction worker that was just with me. And they said, no, we, we've, we saw you coming. We saw you're a firefighter. We were actually kind of worried about what state of mind you might be in. We watched you from the time we saw you about halfway over the bridge come Uh all the way over. There was nobody with you. And again, no explanation to this day, has no idea who that person was. Mm -hmm. Uh, But talk about the Lord sending angels and the provision of presence and these moments of encouragement. And I can't explain that. No. I don't know anybody who could. No. But sometimes the Lord gives us those little smiles. Yeah, and, and just imagine how many of those we've missed. You know, we had Tons. didn't notice yeah. that, you know, when we get to heaven, uh, kind of put replay on our life, we'd be like, oh, man. Right. Uh, I survived that because of this, and you were there for that, and um, it's pretty pretty remarkable that we we have um god doesn't always have to get credit for Mm. all of those he he's not trying to make a splash he's truly just preserving us and moving us through this life as needed yeah you know for his will and his purposes these little smiles from the throne exactly you know like that yeah that's a good thought so Um, i wish i could have used that but uh it had to be cut just for time and something else fit better mm-hmm. but it is a story worth telling yeah, it is that's a that's yeah. a really good one um for me the the i there was a lot of application in these case law i call them case law yeah it's precedent that god set by just writing a particular case the way it might happen right and it, it's precedent it's what we have as case law that when our lawyers and judges are making decisions they can go back and see well this is how the judge uh ruled on this case a hundred years ago right so am i going to change that precedent or it sets precedent on how we decide now yeah and so god was so good to give us these three or four chapters of everyday occurrences and not just give us the 10 general principles is it, you know, with kids, 
mm. t- general doesn't always cut it. You've yeah. got to get specific. <laughs> well, what kind of deodorant? What do you mean yeah. once a day? When do I put it on in the morning? And you know, yep. you need to give some personal. Little, I put know. some on Monday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to be clear. And so God gives some clarity there. And there was one that I mentioned at nine thirty. Um, God applied these principles. And there's one you're probably familiar with Mm -hmm. um, in the area of murder and negligence, because it's clear if you kill so that a person dies, if you hit them so that they die, that's premeditated. Right. And then if you're having a fight and you you hit each other fighting and you're hurt, but the, the guy doesn't die, he comes out, and everybody sees he's okay, you don't lose your life for that. You just right. pay for his medical bills. It says make sure he's healed and pay for the work he lost, mm. the time off of work. I mean, I love that that's added in there. But then there's this one that I wanted to ask your opinion on um, that are you – that's the same – it's a story that's used by both pro-life and pro-choice. Mm. And it, it's this passage where in that area it says when men strive together – Two men are in a fight and hit a pregnant woman. And the the idea is that this is one of the wives, and you'll hear why, trying to break up a fight. So this isn't premeditated murder. She just steps in there. These two guys are having a fight. You can picture this happening. But they accidentally hit this pregnant woman in a way, and it says so that her children come out, talking out of her body. Mm Mm-hmm. So there is no, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him. So one of this is one of them's a husband, one of them's a guy, and the wife's there. And if the guy who isn't her husband hits her or knocks her down or whatever, and she gives birth to a baby or these babies, the husband gets to say, well, you owe me a fine. You hit my wife. You hurt my wife and baby. and But it says, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. So they even, God puts a judge at the end of this one because knowing us, we're going to we're gonna really overdo that fine because you just yeah. hit my wife. Sure. You made her give birth. Yeah. I'm going to sue you, you know, right. under. And so a judge comes in and makes sure it's just. But, if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. So obviously the harm it's talking about there is death. Right. But what's not clear is, is is it the death of the woman or the death of the child or the children that is being talked about there? I think that it's either. If, right. If, it, if the woman dies because you knock her down and she gives birth and she dies, then the person who knocks her over and takes her life even through this negligence, uh, pays with their life. and But it also, I think, uh, refers to the baby. Mm-hmm. And if this baby comes out prematurely and through that birth dies, the, the death penalty is invoked, and it says life for life. Now, with a pro-choice, I mean, a pro-life mindset, right? that really jumps off the page. Yeah. God's just called a a fetus a life. Sure. And, and that's that interpretation we actually don't have an issue with almost anywhere from any mindset because even for the the pro-choice person uh, in a case like this where someone's negligence has caused the death of an unborn child uh, we apply double homicide to cases like this all the time we apply two counts of you know negligent manslaughter vehicular homicide when there are unborn children that are involved in that right so uh even that's true i hadn't thought about that but a double homicide if you kill the woman and the baby inside that's right it's two counts of murder that's right in in almost any state i mean i i don't know one that that would not apply that. So even the ones that are the most uh, friendly toward abortion mm-hmm. uh, apply the law in that way. So uh, the the stare decisis of that kind of case even comes all the way back to what's being demonstrated here 
in in this case. I just think it was pretty startling that in this case, the loss of a of a child, an unborn child, is considered the loss of a life. Yeah, by God's word here, right? And then you have to answer: What's the difference between a man or a woman who then who decide voluntarily? To right. take the life of an unborn, they are taking a life, and that's where, for us today in the in the modern day, we have to ask: Well, why that disconnect? Yeah, why why is it that unborn child car crash? Someone was negligent in causing that crash. Let's say a drunk driver, we would have no problem charging that person twice. Right, but then if it's the decision of the mother. Uh, we don't see it that way at all. Like, where where is that disconnect that we've created in our minds today? I think it's our warped sense of justice. Mm. And because what we think is most just is that I am not inconvenienced by the life of this unwanted birth. Mm. And that somehow uh, it's unjust that I have to, uh, as a woman or as a, or the father of this child, that I have to pay a penalty or a price for um, this unplanned pregnancy. Mm. And so they're thinking the, us in a kind of a warped sense of justice. And so you, they have to redefine this baby as something less than life, I think, to make this choice. I mean, how can they rightly, knowing it is truly a human being that is, is alive, how could they make a choice to murder it? It'd be murder. And so we're, we're right back again to that question of, so who is the author mm-hmm. and designer and creator of life? Yeah. And so where whose life is, who has a rightful claim to that life? And we start from the very top and say, well, it's God first as the author of life, yeah. the creator of life. It's so interesting how out of the Ten Commandments and out of love your neighbor as yourself, all those last five commandments, don't steal, don't yeah. murder, all of these things, the first illustration, the first set of rules or applications had to do with indentured servants, mm. people who were already alive but who had had to sell themselves into some type of servitude and... Um, they would be let go after six years. You know, on the seventh year, they would be free because of the Sabbath law for these servants or slaves. They weren't, well, they weren't really slaves in the sense that we had American slavery. Right. Who They were kidnapped from right. Africa. And by the way, the penalty for kidnapping a human life in these chapters is death. Right. So slave trading, kidnapping human beings and selling them has the death penalty. Right. God is ne- was never pro-slavery. But this was a form of when you were destitute, um, you could uh, be indentured to pay that off or to be provided for in the home of someone who had the ability to, to give you a roof over your head and food, and so you just worked for it. Right, with a, an expiration date. With an expiration yeah. date. That it's it's going to have an end date no matter what. Yes, so the first thing that God applied, he says, you have the right to personhood. You have the right to life. And then he goes into murder. And no one, he says, no one has the right to take that life from you. Yeah. We have the right to personhood. We have the right to life. And then he gets into, we can't take it through negligence. If we're negligent and our uh, ox keeps kills our neighbor accidentally, right? It gores our neighbor. Mm-hmm. You get one pass on that. It wasn't your fault. It was your ox's fault. But if your ox wanders over there a second time and kills another neighbor, that's negligent death penalty for you. So you better get it right after the first time that ox acts up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. If that ox, you put up a fence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your neighbor's life is more valuable than a fence you need to put up to keep your ox on there. And so, but then he goes to this about negligence that takes the life of an infant, an unborn child, and how that is a life as well. Um, Where I was going with this Sunday, and I didn't have 
had no time to do this. Yeah. But I'm going to come back to it is we have um, an amendment in Florida that is on the docket. That's right. We do. And it's it's very deceptive. The title is something like um, making sure everybody has right to Freedom of Health Care Act or something. Mm-hmm. And actually, it is it is all about um, the right to have a to abort a baby uh, as long as a medical provider thinks it's necessary. Beyond if it's beyond if it's before it's viable outside of the womb, anybody. The amendment says anybody can abort their baby. Right. And then after it could live outside of the womb, you can still abort it if a medical professional thinks it's harmful to your health, which is way too, not enough specific. It's, it's very there. broad. Yeah. So here's the question I have for you, Asa, is I have the ability to vote on November the 5th. Mm-hmm. Isn't it an act of negligence if I do not go and cast a vote against that amendment? Mm. Am I not in some way neglecting my neighbor, my unborn neighbor, by refusing to show up and cast a vote against that amendment? Well, uh, everybody has to vote their conscience. Right. And I know a good number of people who, they don't vote at all, ever, in any election, and for them it's a matter of their own uh what they believe to be their Holy Spirit led mm-hmm. guidance on how right. they should interact right. uh, with the government. I think we all have a role in addressing the issue of life. And some people may feel that their most beneficial way of doing that is through going and voting and enacting laws. And others feel it's addressing the other side of that issue, which is to go and be supportive of women and and uh, clinics and uh, the people who are in those situations and making those decisions. And uh, some of some people feel that the best way to do that is through foster care and through adoption. And so I, I would hate to imply that uh, anybody who has chosen not to engage on the issue, but who is doing something right that they're taking any lesser role in what we are all working together on to address. Now, toward the issue itself, I think it would be negligent not to know where this came from Mm -hmm. and where it really came from, when you look at the funding behind it especially, is from relatively few special interest groups who they they have a part in the industry uh, mm. that leads the the way in in that issue and it's and the, they put millions and millions and millions of dollars they do into getting the signatures Absolutely. to put this amendment on there and right if they have to break the 60 percent threshold uh if 60 percent of voters uh there's 60 percent yes versus 40% no, it will be enshrined into our and made an amendment to That's our right. state constitution. Um, and, it, and the similar things going on with uh, recreational marijuana. Yeah. You know, where did that come from? Well, you, where did the, follow the money? Where did the money come from? The vast majority of it, and I mean millions upon millions, tens of millions of dollars, is coming directly from the number one uh supplier of medicinal marijuana in our state yeah it's the the people that they set up shops they if i said the name you'd probably recognize it and they have a vested interest in selling more product yeah and so the thing that we deal with a lot in florida is we go to our constitution to deal with these issues and so now we're going to say that everybody has a right right to marijuana or to abortion or to whatever else we come up with uh the famous one from like 20 years ago is the how pregnant pigs are dealt with Mm. and that's in our state constitution so for years we fought that because there's hundreds of amendments but that said so many of these efforts the reason they end up in front of us is because of the financial interest of somebody somewhere who will make a lot of money off of the decision. Yeah, yeah. Everything's woven together so tightly in our lives, it's hard to 
you know, it's hard to divest yourself of every source of corruption because we're yeah. buying Starbucks coffee and we're, you know, we're going to Target and I mean, we, we live in this community. I guess the thing that I, uh, I think you're very judicious in your answer. Uh, and I wouldn't want to condemn anybody if they felt conviction, they couldn't vote. But I feel like we as Christian citizens, if we have the opportunity to build a fence yeah, through right. voting, right? I mean, we could build a fence between the ox and that unborn baby. Right. It's just, we, we take, if we don't build the fence, right. I think as a whole, we've been negligent as the body of Christ. We just, we're complicit. If we're not using the one tool we have to mm-hmm. speak into the secular world, um, well, it's not the one tool. We have other tools, right? But we can we can do a lot more than some of the things that we've done yeah. so far. Yeah. And the answer is holistic. It's it's voting and praying and yeah. serving and loving and adopting and everything else. You know, we we can approach this from a holistic way, and it will take a holistic approach to do this. Yeah. Um, so certainly. Uh, I look forward to going and voting, um, and and you know me well enough to know uh, I'm very engaged politically. Mm-hmm. I love politics, uh, and I encourage everyone who does vote to go and vote. Yeah. Um, so you know my my response is simply to say I I know there are some people that they 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 don't feel led to go into that voting booth because whether it's they sense that they're uninformed and they don't want to decide wrongly or, or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. They just feel mm-hmm. led not to engage in that part of the process. But those who vote should go and vote their conscience and should go and vote their, their Christian values because we have a voice. Let's use it. Yeah. And so let's be informed. And I think uh, it is a type of negligence to not be informed and kind of know, have what's, up, what's something. New. And I know the desire because a lot of times I want to bury my head in the sand and mm-hmm. not look. <laughs> it well, is, it's such a is challenging world distressing we live in. picture. There's rioting and all of yeah. those kind of things going on. And uh, well, Ace, it's been real fun having you on here today. Yeah, and I uh, appreciate every time you uh, bring the word. And uh, uh, we love you and appreciate you as a staff person at, at Westside. And uh, any final words to our listening audience? That's going to grow, probably double, because you've been on here. I don't know about that, but uh, when you don't know where to turn or what to do, <laughs> you look for the hand of God in your life, and no matter where he's leading, if you don't know where or why or why now, trust his hand. He'll lead you safely home. Well said. Well, it's been what we didn't say on Sunday, but if you want to hear what we have to say this coming Sunday, I'm up. Asa, you're not up this Sunday, I'm but not. you'll be up a Sunday coming soon Richie is sure back from Romania Richie will be back so we hope to see you next week God bless